Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 669. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is June 16th, 2021. All right, welcome to another program of Anglican Unscripted. We're glad you're here, and we're glad that right now you are looking on your screen to see where you can click that like button. We appreciate that, because when you like us on Facebook and when you like us on YouTube, that's free advertising. That tells the algorithms at those big socialist constructs of the Communist Party that they can promote this show pretty safely because people like it. If you did this, that's anti-advertising. This is pro-advertising, and we appreciate that. Please share this show with your friends, neighbors, and enemies, especially your enemies. And if you've not subscribed yet, now is your chance. We also have this show in a podcast format. You can find that in the show notes. And like always, the show continues in the comments. Lots of great comments this week on last week's show. We really appreciate that. George, how are you doing this week? Wonderful. Getting ready to go away next week for the week-long course on the Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. My wife and I are going to be trained uh, in this uh, really exciting Christian education program. And uh, so I'm getting all my work done this week because I'll be out next week. But we'll yeah. still make time to film. <laughs> yeah, we got, we'll try f to get some filming in the evening or at lunch or before. Uh, or it would be really helpful out there to all the Anglican leaders in the world if you have no news next week. If you could just take the, the week off and pretend it's the end of August, that would be very beneficial to Anglican Unscripted, and maybe George and I could actually take an, a nice week off without worrying about the news. Um, I'm still camped out here uh, on the southeast side of uh, Connecticut, and we'll be here for another week or two, and then we're headed off to the, the Pittsburgh area. And if uh, any of you people from Pittsburgh would want to get together for lunch or something, just send me an email. It's anglicantv at gmail.com. Be a lot of fun. And Kevin, you left just in time. About day after uh, Memorial Day, we started the three o'clock rain showers. So it is beautiful, luxurious green outside. Beautiful the flowers, the grasses, the trees, and it's a hundred percent humidity. So <laughs> you, when you come back, it'll uh, be a little drier. Hopefully, it'll, it'll be drier. Green. Well, our hope is to come back and then race down to the Keys for a week or two. Uh, we haven't been to the Keys before, and uh, if you time it right. One of the things about full-time RVing, as we discovered, is not only is everybody doing it, but this year they've really reopened all the federal park or state parks and national parks. And I was just reading a story where there's four-hour lines to go on hikes at Mount Zion National Park. And that you can't get campgrounds in any of these national parks anymore because uh, everybody's doing what Kevin is doing. And you need to stop that. I, I can't. I want to denounce RVing right now. It's a horrible lifestyle. It's costly. It's okay. It's fun. It's relaxing, and it's it's something new every week. But uh, everybody's doing it. It's kind of uh, one of those things that COVID caused. And uh, uh, this is going to be a very difficult year to go to your state parks and your uh, national parks for sure. George, let's move on to the news. You and I have said for the longest time. The ACNA needs to comment on critical race theory. They need to come out and, at the College of Bishops level, somewhere make a statement. Uh, because we see internally, at the uh, lay level and the clergy level, that there's a struggle with where critical race theory falls in line with the Christian faith. It's a theory. It's pseudo-sociology uh, at best. Um, if you look at it in its purest culture Marxist form, it's anti-Christian, not pro-Christian, and it creates two opposing people, the oppressed and the oppressor. So it was very nice to finally see Bishop Ray Sutton of the REC put in his uh, report uh, and uh, talk, a denunciation of CRT, and the denunciation of uh, hyphenated Christianity. In his address to the General Council of the Reformed Episcopal Church, Ray Sutton, who's their presiding bishop, uh, and the REC, of course, is one of the constituent members of the Anglican Church in North America, 
Uh, about four or five pages into his speech, where he goes through basically the state of the church and everything, he then moves to some of the issues that they're working on and being pressed on. And the first was uh, critical race theory. And as far as I'm concerned, Bishop Sutton hit a home run with bases loaded. He, in language that is much more polished and polite than mine uh, on this show, uh, basically pointed out that it's incompatibility with the Christian faith, that it's incompatibility with, you know, the Pauline epistles, with Christ's mission on this earth to reconcile. Um, separating people according to race is anti-Christian. Mm -hmm. And he also pointed out that CRT's Marxist antecedents, which reject the Christian message of reconciliation, of forgiveness, of fellowship, so I encourage you all to look at Ray Sutton's words as he wrote them, not as I explained them. You can do that on Anglican Inc. where we have the transcript of his address. You go about fourth or fifth page down the PDF at the bottom, and you'll see what he says. Yeah, I'll put a link, to, Ray, I'll put a link to the story in the show notes. But what, what, what Bishop Sutton is doing on one level is what any Christian leader should be doing. In other words, he's standing forthrightly for the faith against the uh, siren call of culture and political correctness today. Um, New York Times, for instance, had an op-ed piece the other day by a man named Charles Blow, one of their opinion writers, who went on and on and on about how critical race theory is, it's not harmless, it's just what right-wing Christian nationalists uh, perceive. And uh, of course, in other words, Blow basically told the big lie, repeated the big lie, where Bishop Sutton calmly, succinctly, eviscerated the lies of people like Charles Blow, Ibrahim Kendi, and also some within the Anglican Church in North America, certainly within the Episcopal Church of the USA and the Church of England and the Anglican Church of Canada, who are pushing. Uh, we, we had a show that caused some controversy a few months ago where we noted that one ACNA bishop said that CRT was an aid in Christian evangelism. Actually, it's an aid in de-Christian evangelism. Yes, it is. <laughs> according, uh, if you read and take to heart what Bishop Sutton is saying. Mm -hmm. And I'm just so happy that there's a man of... See, this Bishop Sutton, of course, is a man of substance and stature. He was a seminary professor. This man's no talking head like George. Uh, this is somebody who <laughs> is well-educated, <laughs> well popped He's a somebody. Kevin's exactly right. Yeah. And he is stating the truth through the prism and the lens of Jesus Christ. And I'm so grateful for that work. Now, I just wish the ACNA takes us forward. <laughs> well, sorry, I interrupted you. The, well, no, they're meeting this week in uh, North Carolina. So I would expect, hopefully, that they would approve some statement on critical race theory. And we will we'll see something coming out of that. Jeff Walton, a frequent contributor to Anglican Unscripted, is down there. So hopefully we get some news soon. Are they at Ridgecrest again, or are they further up the road? It's something else, as far as I know. It's called the Billy Graham Center, Center, Center. I thought Ridgecrest got sold, so I don't know if they're at, if they're at Ridgecrest or I not. I couldn't stand Ridgecrest. Oh, I hated that place. But... It was oh. uh, many buildings making up a, uh, a nice little campus, but yes, it was built on the side of a hill. hill. <laughs> it was all Everything uphill. uphill, middle of nowhere. Uh, <laughs> There, in fact, everything on the other side of campus, oh, I don't think I can get there. <laughs> it was just too far to go. Yeah, it, difficult going at Ridgecrest. So um, it would be really nice to, right now, ACNA, this is, if, if you want to speak on critical race theory, now is the time. Uh, don't wait months because uh, there's already a lot of murmuring going around in the ranks of the clergy of the ACNA. It's time to put your foot down and say, this is what the House of Bishops or the College of Bishops believes. You did a great job uh, with your sex and gender statement and your hyphenated statement a couple months back. Let, let's up the game. There's something else going on in culture. And uh, Bishop, uh, Bishop Sutton reaffirmed the, uh, the hyphenated statement, if you will, mm -hmm. that essentially there is no, we, we don't think in terms of gay Christians. 
just as we don't think of terms of black Christians and white Christians, because what happens is the emphasis is placed on the first word, not the second, mm -hmm. where you make the first word the center and the Christian modifying that first word. When we're either a Christian or we're not, we're either one in Christ or we're not. Um, it, it really was well said. And, but where Bishop Sutton's agenda is different from Kevin and mine, ours is to advance an, an argument or a position, just chat about things. Uh, sometimes we don't know what we're talking about. <laughs> Bishop Sutton's, Bishop Sutton appears to, in his statement, to try to get those clergy and active lay people who have sort of been bitten by this bug to sort of pull back and sort of see where it's taking them. So his is a more pastoral approach. It's not confrontational. It's not you must believe or you're going to hell. Um, but rather, it's really well done. Kudos to Bishop Sutton. Absolutely. Anglican Scripted is done at the analytical level. We sit here, we talk about stories, we analyze the news, and we pontificate. We tell you George's opinion and Kevin's opinion. Hopefully you agree with us. If you don't, you often go to the show notes and tell us where we're wrong. And sometimes you're right about where we're wrong. We appreciate that. We, you know, This is a show where we, we don't mind being corrected. Uh, in as such, it was very nice to hear Ray Sutton kind of repeat word for word what we've been saying now for about six months. You know, but in I, a nicer tone. In a, in a much more godly tone. I, <laughs> we appreciate that. Next story, guilted until proven guilty. Uh, guilty until proven guilty. And uh, you and I have talked many times about the change in leadership at the Church of England level, the bishop level, over at least 14 to 18 years. They, they've gone to a place where there was leadership over the clergy. They were allowed to, to speak in public. They were allowed to have Facebook feeds and Twitter accounts. And they kind of cared about the mission of the church. We just posted a story this week on Anglican Inc. where we had, if I go down here farther enough, a canon chancellor who had been suspended for about 790 days for uh, sexual misconduct has been cleared by the courts, the secular courts. And this is kind of a follow-up to other stories where we talked about where people are found innocent, but the church still considers them guilty. And certainly the leadership in the church still considers them guilty, George. There's tremendous disquiet uh, among the rank-and-file clergy and among educated lay people, or involved lay people, I should say, in the Church of England over the dysfunctional clergy disciplinary measure. It is being applied in an arbitrary fashion. It, some people are untouchable. Other people have their lives destroyed. And the we I published the documents uh, on the Lincoln case, the statements by the various players, um, without comment, um, because it's I, I don't think any comment need be said. Paul Overend was Canon Chancellor of Lincoln Cathedral. That's a big job. That's mm -hmm. a big deal. It's a nice, he's a somebody. He's not a nobody. He's not the vicar down in Okeechobee, uh, for goodness sakes. He was accused, for, or in 1997, it was alleged that he uh, behaved inappropriately at a church social gathering. And when this was reported, he was immediately suspended. Something that happened 25 years ago at a party he doesn't remember, in a claim from a woman he doesn't remember, for an action that was totally out of character for him. So it was he a, is a, a, a Brett Kavanaugh. He's suspended yes. for two years. And they go through a legal trial, not guilty. And then, and only then, after a year and a half, two year legal process, does the Church of England do it year and a half legal process does the Church of England do its own tribunal and then clears him of no, you know, he didn't do anything. So meanwhile, his life is in limbo. He reported that his wife had to be admitted to an inpatient facility because she was suicidal and he had thoughts of suicide. It was a Kafkaesque situation that he was guilty and he was proven until he was proven otherwise. The church starts with the premise that any complaint, no matter how ridiculous, you're guilty. And the same and stroking a woman's hair, 
that was what the accusation was against Martin Percy, that he allegedly stroked a girl's hair. Uh, and because of that, they've had five disciplinary complaints on various grounds, all of which he's been found not guilty. But the church is still grinding along. And because of that, the church rules say that there must be two gardeners working in his garden at Christchurch College at any one time because he's a potential threat. The man's almost nearly been bankrupted. He has to spend his own money to defend himself against these malicious charges uh, that are put forward by people out to get him. And we compare that to Tim Dakin, Bishop of Winchester, mm -hmm. who has who knows how many complaints lodged against him. Is he ever suspended for things that are far worse than stroking a woman's hair? Is he ever suspended for lying for the things that he has d done that we've enumerated in other shows? Of course not. He's a bishop. But the dean of Christ Church, Church, Church Cathedral and the canon chancellor of Lincoln Cathedral, who are somebodies, but they're not bishops. They're guilty. We had this story that we reported last week about a college, uh, I'm sorry, a, a school chaplain. About three weeks uh, ago, yeah. In the north of England, mm -hmm. who was reported to the police for allegedly uh, terrorist talk in his chapel talk, where he talked about the value of thinking for yourself. He said, you don't have to accept uncritically all the latest and greatest gay, lesbian, transgender, bisexual theories. Think about it for yourself. He repeated standard Christian doctrine. The school called the police on this guy. Bishop Libby Lane, the Bishop of Derby, his bishop, he went to her asking for help. Sorry, can't help you. <laughs> what the hell is the point of a bishop? I mean... This is this is the sort of thing that Libby Lane should be kicked out of the Episcopate for incompetence, for lack of knowing what her job is. I mean, this is just dreadful. Where's the Bishop of Oxford for Martin Percy? I don't know. Where well, is the Bishop? Of, well, the Bishop of Lincoln was suspended, so I don't think there is one. Yeah. Uh, for a, for a, for something, but the Church of England's top management and its lawyers have so fouled its reputation that it's now it used to be a pleasant joke now it's a sinister joke well, you know it's gotten really bad you and i have commented about it you and i have gavin have talked about it gavin and i have talked about it the way they pick bishops in the church of england is completely broken it's done by mm -hmm. committee it's not done by uh, a gathering of the diocese and meeting the candidates and praying about it and voting on it. This is just a small committee that makes sure that they get the company people in. And they've mm -hmm. been doing the company people thing for far too long. And the, the pendulum that has been swinging, uh, we didn't do enough when there were sexual allegations before. That pendulum is coming back this way. We're going to do enough, and if you're ever accused, you'll regret that day. And, you know, where, where's the, the middle ground for the pendulum? Where is the person who is accused have rights? Well, when you're in the Church of England, if you're accused, you, you, you have no rights anymore. Um, well, we, we, saw, we saw this the Catholic Church go through this pendulum as well of, for a generation, ignoring abuse victims and then going overboard the other direction. Uh, guilty until proven innocent. Uh, in the early 90s, uh, a man who was uh, my professor of theology at the time, Avery Dulles, he went on to become a cardinal, wrote an article in First Things that I think almost uh, that caused him a great deal of grief among the hierarchy where he said Christianity is about forgiveness and the new model from the House of Bishops does away with any semblance of forgiveness. Now he was separating it from the crime but the, the approach of the Catholic bishops was that you're guilty until proven innocent, and even if you, and there's no forgiveness for what you've done. Um, we're seeing that replicated in the Church of England of uh, guilty uh, until you're proven otherwise, and the concept of compassion and forgiveness and just helping somebody who may have their life, he may be, may, let's, imaginary case, somebody who really does bad things. 
the bishop should still be for there for them in a spiritual sense, not saying, oh, it's okay that you molested a child, but rather let's talk about your soul. Mm -hmm. And we don't have bishops who do that anymore. We don't have bishops who are fathers in God to their clergy. At least, well, I, that's not been my experience in 20 I, years. Because I have a good association with ACNA, I do know many who are that, but I also agree with you. Uh, Church-wide, that's not the model. In fact, the ACNA actually has a course to teach a bishop how to be a bishop and teach other Anglicans how to be a bishop. And so uh, that needs to be a model of the church. The church has got one of those, but yeah. it, it basically is accounting 101 for bishops. How do you know? <laughs> I mean, how to stretch out the money and uh, how to sue people. It's not about how to have that charism of episcopacy. But I think the, the GAFCON bishops, of course, is trying to teach that charism mm -hmm. uh, with the Episcopal Church one. It's just dreadful. Yeah. All right, let's talk about good news. People complain we don't talk about enough about good news on Anglican Scripted. Well, let's make it a policy. Once a year, George, we're going to have a good news story. Okay, once a decade. All right. From so, an unexpected source, too. <laughs> yes. So um, it, we got a vast audience. I don't know your knowledge of history, your knowledge of uh, certainly the um, Holocaust, uh, what happened uh, during that time, but uh, if you ever get a chance to visit the Holocaust museums in uh, uh, Israel, please do so. There, it, it's a we life change. Went, we went, we yeah. went there, didn't we? Bad yeah. Yashem. Yeah, and we, I went to the Children's uh, Holocaust uh, Remembrance, and oh, George. Uh, yeah, uh, I I remember I went. Uh, I was in the little. They put you in groups because there yeah. were so many of us. But I went with Bishop Oko and some Ni Archbishop Oko in Nigeria, yeah. and uh, to mm. see the uh, Bad Yashem Memorial. Yeah. So, uh, we don't have. I guess one way we celebrate uh, great people in the church is we add them to our calendar, and uh, uh, Jane Haney, who stayed behind with the Jewish children who were uh, about to be uh, certainly uh, killed and consumed by fires uh, in Auschwitz and other places, uh, is being remembered. She now is, has a calendar day. Tell me a little bit about Jane. Well, on Friday, uh, Jane Haining was added to the calendar of uh, commemoration, or saints, if you will, but we don't call them saints, but it's no. functionally the same for the Scottish Episcopal Church. So we're giving a good news story from the Scottish Episcopal Church. They've done the right thing for the right reasons for the right person. Mm -hmm. And it coincidentally was, well, coincidentally was Anne Frank's birthday. Jane Haining was the daughter of a minister who, uh, after a career as a secretary at a company in the early 20s, late 20s, volunteered to be a missionary and for the to the Jews and was sent out to Budapest to be a matron and teacher at a school that had Jewish and Christian girl students. During the 30s, the things turned very bad in Central Europe. In fact, they had German Jews who would try to get their children out of Germany by sending them to the boarding school in Budapest. Mm -hmm. When the war broke out, the uh, church said to Jane, come home. And the British government said, come home. Jane said, no, I was here in good times for these girls. I can't leave them in limbo. The Hungarian government said, after, after a number of more years and the war is getting worse, says, get out. In 1944, when the Nazis, during the army, takes over Hungary and installs a fascist puppet regime, the Gestapo said, get out. She stayed. She stayed with the Jewish girls, some of whom were now orphans. And she was denounced and arrested, sent to Auschwitz with many of her girls, the younger ones killed upon arrival. She and some of the older ones were able to work and she died. And her, and her body was cremated in the ovens of Auschwitz. And her ashes among the ashes of her children um, spread you know, around Auschwitz. The Scottish Episcopal Church has named her a martyr for Christ. I mean, the picture, if you look at the picture of her on Anglican Inc., and we published a little, we, we republished a BBC little documentary on her. 
that has some of the memories of some of the girls who survived Auschwitz, her students. Here was a, a spinster with uh, sensible shoes, granny glasses. Um, Kevin calls her the church lady uh, Absolutely. from Saturday Night Live. <laughs> not, not in action and not in uh, uh, emotion, but certainly in look. Look, I, I, to me, she reminds me of Jane Hathaway from the Beverly Hills. Oh, Hills. sure, another one, yeah. This is someone who had every reason to leave. She'd been told to leave, but she did what she felt Christ had called her to do, which was to be there for these girls. And she paid the sacrifice with those girls of dying as a Christian, as a martyr, and an example for us as mm -hmm. Christians of how to live our life. And I just am so encouraged by that. Um, I'll just contrast uh, the latest push by the Episcopal Church. They want to add Juneteenth, which is June 13th, to the Ch Episcopal Church's calendar. That's the day in the United States we mark the emancipation of the slaves. It's taken from June 13th when the Union Army arrived in Galveston in 1865. They formed the slaves that they were free. Even though Lincoln had signed the Emancipation Proclamation er much earlier, they didn't know because of the war. And so that day within the African-American community is sort of remembered as the day of emancipation. Some states have it as a secular holiday. The Diocese of California wants to add it to the church calendar. Now, my personal view is that's great as a secular holiday. Yeah, awesome. Wonderful. It should absolutely be celebrated, you know, when, when liberation has been announced, absolutely. But, you know, we only have two secular holidays in the church calendar in the United States. Independence Day, the 4th of July, and Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. Memorial Day, Veterans Day, uh, Mother's Day uh, are not church holidays. Now, of course, most churches celebrate Veterans Day, Memorial Day, and things like that. Labor Day. But they're not true church holidays. And I think... I would prefer the church calendar to commemorate people who are examples for us of Christian witness and living rather than historical events that really, how can Juneteenth motivate me to be a better Christian compared to uh, Jane Haining? Or even MLK. That's, well, that'd be a great day to have on the church calendar. I, so, so please church... don't hear me. Yeah. And I know there were two or three people who watch our show just to complain each week. And, uh, good for you. It's cheaper than going to psychiatrist, I know. Uh, but, you know, we're not knocking the holiday, the secular holiday, no, or what it all. stands for, or yeah. how its value in certain parts of the American society. What we are saying is, what should church holidays be versus secular holidays? Mm -hmm. And, you know, this goes into the, there's a, uh, among younger evangelicals uh, who've come from outside the Anglican tradition, you see this in the ACNA, we get these guys who absolutely go ballistic if you have an American flag anywhere around the uh, the sanctuary. Oh, that's Christian nationalism. I grew up as a Baptist and we had the flags waving in our face all the time. You know, and they're overreacting. Uh, and so, you know, we shouldn't celebrate the 4th of July because that's not a Christian holiday. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just be an Anglican a little bit longer and you'll figure it out. Um, but th this is not that, this is not one of those issues. I think that, that the church needs to put focus on. I think the issue needs to be people, the life and witness of saints of God like Jane Hanning. I mean, well, there's, turn to hymn number 293, <laughs> I sing a song of the saints of God. Read the text of that hymn and you will understand what Anglicans believe about saints. For the folk of God are, the saints of God are people like you and me and God helping to be one too. Absolutely. Well, once again, nice to do a good story once, or, once a decade. But I was just reading the news, especially if you go to like getreligion.org. Um, Southern Baptist Convention's falling apart, George. I, it wasn't part of our pre-show, um, but they're they're suffering by not uh, taking on these issues. But they had the pendulum suffrage right now. The pendulum is, was way over here on the wrong side for the longest term. It went loose, and now it went way over here. The, the pendulum is just taking out the Southern Baptist Convention. Um, is that the fate of the ACNA in the future, or certainly? The Southern Baptist Convention has a history of being overtly political. Mm -hmm. 
as you mentioned in the 80s they went from being sort of middle of the road with the prominence of uh, Jerry Falwell and that sort of flavor of Bap Baptist Americans very becoming political. very conservative yeah becoming involved in secular politics mm -hmm. then uh, that sort of has faded in the last five or six years especially well under the Obama in the Obama administration in particular it started going the other way the Washington office of the Baptist the uh, and it started getting on board the woke train and now the administrators, the bureaucrats, sort of the uh, public faces, find themselves estranged from the base because they're left wing and the base is conservative. Um, Southern Baptists make up a conservative part of the United States. So if you would say, I would say 80 to 99, 80 to 90 percent of rank and file Southern Baptist clergy voted for Donald Trump. Uh, if you look at the Washington office, it's probably 10 percent. Mm -hmm. And so that fight I'm exaggerating, of course, but that fight is uh, in society is being mirrored in the uh, Southern Baptist Convention. Will that pass on to the uh, ACNA? There is the potential, because there are unthinking people, there are unthinking bishops who parrot the the uh, church of what's happening now. Now, the Episcopal Church, we see the results of that. The Episcopal Church traditionally had been a church of liberals, evangelicals, and Anglo-Catholics. And when the liberals got 50% plus one, it was over. Yeah. So, in other words, we would see general conventions where uh, the liberal bloc would just, you know, pass resolution after resolution after resolution that was offensive to the conservatives, the evangelicals, and Anglo-Catholics. They didn't care, and there was even no debate. They would call the question immediately, and it would be a 50% plus one vote. Um, now, thankfully, part of the formation of the ACNA was to prevent that, um, to prevent the ACNA general council from running roughshod, so that it had to work in parallel with the bishops. But unless the bishops uh, sort of rein in some of their loose cannons among their ranks, you'll see that discord passed down into the into the uh, wider church okay about once a month we talk about China uh, it pops up on the news certainly because the, there's a desire to uh, e evangelize China that's been a desire for hundreds of years there's been a desire to try and work with the Communist Party of China that has not resulted in much success and there is a extremely large 100 to 20, 100 to 60 million uh, member underground church in China. Well, if Kevin, been... I, I think I will argue a point. Okay. It's been a great success for the Communist Party of China of working with elements of the United States. <laughs> yeah, of course it has. <laughs> it's just for the interests of the United States, it's been a dismal failure. Well, and I would say, this is just Kevin pontificating, that China in 10 years and for the next 100 years is going to be the major superpower um, unless we can uh, change how we're dealing with China and stop some of their more horrible practices. The UN is finally keying in on one of those really bad practices and that's the harvesting of uh, organs from people they've enslaved and people that they have not enslaved just normal citizens uh, to sell on the black market and the UN finally put out a little statement saying it's extremely concerned that there's organ harvesting going on here in China <laughs> it's like I can't believe there's gambling happening here in Casablanca so <laughs> Kevin's right uh, in the pre-show Kevin mentioned that he doesn't think much will come from this because China's on the Security Council mm -hmm. and they'll veto anything stronger but UN has actually done something right of pointing out that the Chinese government there is it's past the point of just talk it's shown it's demonstrated to be true with fact the Chinese government forcibly harvests organs from political prisoners from religious minorities uh, Falun Gong the Uyghur Muslims um, in and, other words when they arrest you they, test, and, they yeah. do body they type test you Mm -hmm. And if an order comes for your kidney that matches you, they kill you and harvest and kill you, take your kidney. Um, 
two kidneys. First, they take your kidney. Two kidneys. kidneys. (laughs) And And then then the liver. Yeah. Yeah. The liver and all that. Yeah. Um, And there's been documentation that this was ordered by the top echelon of the Communist Party, the Mm -hmm. premier. Um, So this is an abhorrent evil practice, as is the genocide against the Uyghurs, as is the uh, approaching suppression and crushing of Christianity, forbidding children to attend catechism and worship, arresting clergy who provide children's education, calling it brainwashing. Um, when I mention, and part of the problem is just the stupidity of the elites in the West. Um, I'll, I'll give you something that I, I happen to know a little bit about. I, I like, I'm a car guy. I'm a gearhead. Uh, I have all the burns on my hands to show from working on cars. You want to see that one? That was a, this one. That was a manifold uh, nice. the other day. <laughs> um, Ford has said that by a certain point, I think it's 2030, there'll be majority electric cars. Well, where do 90% of the materials for electric car batteries come from? China. China controls the mines for rare earth around the earth. They bought them up, ship all the raw materials to China, and then they sell it to the United States at whatever price they want. If you want to go buy a Ford F-150 right now, it's going to be tough. If you do, you have to pay over list because there's a shortage of chips uh, because uh, Ford cut its uh, purchase orders during the COVID crisis. And now the Japanese manufacturers can't ramp up production fast enough. Um, what it's doing is basically handing the Chinese control of the auto industry in a way that's greater than they control it now. So how is this, you know, it, it, it's just unthinking. I mean, instead of, so the United States, and here's the thing, where does, where does the electricity come from to gener- power these cars? comes from coal-fired power plants. So all you greeny weenies out there, you got to think about through these things. Well, I don't mind setting goals. They have the goal to have uh, green energy uh, as an ongoing thing. Great. Is that if that's your goal? But please be honest in your goals. Uh, Half electric vehicles by 2030. That's that's not going to happen. Uh, but if you want to put a goal on paper, do it. But you have to also 20, look at, yeah. There are 25,000 charging stations in the United States. Mm-hmm. Over half are in California. There are 1.9 million gas stations. There is no charging station in my county or the two counties around me. So a four, and there's a Ford dealership, three or four within a driving distance. How is Ford? going to sell cars that people can't charge except by having them hooked up overnight for 16, 20 hours. And Tesla isn't sharing their chargers. Mm. Uh, Tesla has the greatest uh, infrastructure for charging cars, but only a Tesla can recharge there. So, Mm. you know, that's just one of the realities. Elon Musk went in early, went in hard and put up his infrastructure, but Ford can't use that. Uh, Nissan can't use that. Chevy, nobody can use the uh, Tesla battery uh, infrastructure. Yeah, Volkswagen, Volkswagen's changing over its factory in Chattanooga from making of uh, Passats to making electrical vehicles. Mm-hmm. And they're doing that in Germany right now, and they make a pretty good product. Problem is, there's no infrastructure. And I very much doubt that there's any appetite to build more nuclear power plants to provide the electricity. Otherwise, you've got to build more coal fire plants, and we can't do that either. Yeah. Well, I think there's not a lot of joined up thinking on these no. issues. And what you want to really look back, we're talking about China being the future supreme power. Um, China has been buying up debt, uh, especially in African nations. African nations where you get these rare materials for batteries. Uh, and China itself is a, a great supplier of the rare, rare earth materials you needed for uh, lithium ion batteries. Uh, that's where the future lies as far as China is concerned. And you watch where they're investing, you watch where they're buying debt. They're thinking 100 years down the road. Well, we're thinking 2030. Next quarter. Next, <laughs> Next quarter. quarter. Yeah, that's right. So um, it's called, if you want to go on uh, the internet and Google DEP trap diplomacy that's uh, going to be a strong marker for china d-e-b-t 
hyphen, even though I can't use hyphens, trap <laughs> diplomacy. Uh, what else we got on our stories, George? Oh, they found a home. One of the things I love about uh, archaeology in the Bible is they find the most mundane things of characters that go way back in the Bibles. There's you know mentions of a couple uh, families back in Jeremiah, and they actually found you know just off the cuff evidence of this family. You know, like well, if that's true, then what else is true? <laughs> you know, <laughs> and so we have just finally found um, Herod the Great's palace in Ashkelon. Yeah. Uh, the uh, the Jewish Antiquities Authority has uh, released news of a major historical find, a 2,000-year-old uh, basilica and buildings, the largest Roman-era structures discovered so on Earth so far in Israel in that area. And the indication and the evidence shows that this was the palace, the, the place of Herod the Great, one of the big guys in the Bible. Uh, read your Luke and Matthew. That's right. He's a First Testament guy, but not, not a good guy. Um, you know, it's, it's neat that, you know, for the longest time, people would always, you know, refer to the Bible as uh, fable, myth, great stories uh, told uh, generation upon generation and it ended up in print. It's so nice that we can go back, for the most part, uh, and discover that these were real places, these were real people, these were really real events. And uh, your, your faith in Scripture, uh, so far, as I can tell, is secure. <laughs> so, it, nice to see that, indeed. George, I think we've come to the last and end of our stories. What are we at here? 42 minutes? That's not bad. We're giving people a break today. Not bad at all. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 669 of Anglican Unscripted.